there's the red light and there's the shocked face and there's the professional. <laughs> um, hello, hello, and welcome to the latest Forza Italian Football Podcast, take two. I am your host, Connor Clancy, returning again, also returning again for a second consecutive week. Dov Giovanni, is that you? <laughs> it is, it is. Um, I like how you put your national team shirt on. I'm going to mention it so you don't. Um, <laughs> so everybody knows where you're from. I, I'm from Ireland. It's just I'm a, not. Look, you're also sitting there in your national team shirt. Yeah, yeah, no, it's and hot, I think man. we both have the same reason. It's very hot <laughs> in North Italy at the moment, especially when there isn't a sea for 200 kilometers. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not the nicest. <laughs> it really it's not isn't. the nicest. Two in the morning, is it? What is it, about 28? 29 degrees, it's not pleasant. Uh, it's, uh, so, it's only 25 for me, so it's all right. Well, ish, just now, but yeah, uh, it's better than 34 degrees in the baking midday sun. That is disgusting. Yeah, I mean, it's not pleasant, is it? Especially when the humidity is so high and this. Yeah, I'm sure people don't want to listen to us moan about living in Italy, though, to be honest with you. Oh, that's rubbish, mate. It. Italy's crap. I don't know what people Terrible, are seeing it? this place, honestly. Terrible. There's, there's no say. There's no football. I, I was know. saying that. The guy yeah, on the man. bus when I was coming back home from Genoa the other day was like, why do you live here? Because he, really? he thinks he was Italian and he was telling me how Italy's crap and that I'm stupid to live here. I get so maybe, maybe, he was on it. maybe he was on it something. Who knows? Yeah, but then when you ask them, have they ever been to your home country? They say no. And they like, well, there, <laughs> there you go. go. There you go. Um, yeah. Vito Doria is from a nice country, Australia. Vito, hello. Hi, Connor. Yeah, good to oh. be on the pod again. Yeah, I'm sorry for Dov not letting me introduce you for a good minute and a half there, but thanks for sitting patiently. <laughs> That's all good. Don't, hold um, on, don't blame me for this. This is your fault. Never my fault. I'm the right. host. Nothing is ever my fault. I can always just pin the blame on either of you two and get away with it. It's fine. Whatever. Uh, right, let's not start on such a confrontational note, Dov. Right? I know you love it, but let's behave ourselves for a couple of hours. Um, we were at a few games this weekend. I was at one, you were at two, Vieri was at one, Alistair was at one, and the big games too, especially mine. Um, but let's let's start with yours because last season's top two went head to head in Turin. Um, Juventus went three nil up, then Napoli scored four goals, but Napoli lost four three. What happened? I think it was the delict switched off for 15 minutes possibly like two goals were his fault um i was just uh, i was a bit of kind of a freak period really because juventus were the best team for an hour um napoli had really nothing uh, against them at all um ancelotti said so in his press conference after the game he's like juventus deserved to win and they said, when I say deserved, I mean that they dominated for an hour and we had no answer to them whatsoever. Um, obviously, it was kind of unlucky, uh, Koulibaly's goal at the end. But I think you, you, would, you would say that Juventus deserved to win it if you were kind of looking on, on a, a balanced standpoint of who was good and who wasn't. Um, but I just think it's uh, the, the, the new Sarri's new Juve. Um, I think people kind of have expected when they went 2-0 up that it was going to be an Allegri UV of, right, it's 2 0 up, that's a game over. And then when the third goal went in, I thought, right, no chance now. And I think for, for me, there were two, say, turning points or two things. One was Lozano coming on at half time. So I thought he had uh, a good impact in terms, of, in terms of Napoli's attack. He's a, a lot more direct and he kind of gave Delict a bit of a torrid time. And Kadira going off for UV. Because I thought he was brilliant um, up there with the candidates for man of the match as well. Um, I and think I thought, he got into our team of the week, actually. Could they? I, did, I, I was blown did. away by him. Um, yeah, and Vieri got some stick for that as well because people were like, what about Douglas Costa? And I'm like, Douglas Costa got a couple of assists, fair enough. But I think Kadira kind of controlled that game. I think there's a one point where he... That well, wasn't him, it was Di Chilio, I think, who outdid... Um, Gulam for pace down the wing. I was, I'm just like, wow, Gulam is done. If you're getting done for pace by De Chile. <laughs> literally, it was like, I was like an old school kind of tap it past him and run. And I was like, wow, Gulam is not the player he was before he was injured. No, uh, he's really not, is he? And there are times when it is exposed, and you think it will harm yeah, Napoli. The, Mario Ruiz. The one, the one thing I will say about the game, though, is. When Koulibaly's goal went in, I think about four or five of the Napoli players just collapsed on the park because obviously 
like uh, they'd come back from three goals down or whatever. But I think that's 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 a result that can affect a team for a season. Um, to to get it back to three three and then still lose mm. in the last minute with an own goal from arguably your best player. And you just say, like, what? What do you need to do? And I think that's probably it's, obviously it's two rounds in, but that's killed Napoli's any any chance they had of challenging Juve. That's killed it. Yeah, if there was going to be a title race, you think it could be important, but there's not going to be a title race, so it's not really going to matter all that much, I suppose. Vito, what did you make of this? Because Dov kind of touched on it. If Massimiliano Allegri was still in charge of Juventus, they wouldn't have blown that three-goal lead. I know you like your attacking football, but time and a place. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. There's one thing, well, two things you've got to look at. One, how a neutral or, or a spectator would see the sport. And then, of course, there's the perspective of the coaches. Ideally, from the fans' perspective, this was great. You had drama, you had the seven goals. Um, both teams uh, went at it with the right mentality to just go for the win and score as much as they can. From a coach, though, you would be frustrated with the lack of good defending and in the Allegri era you would definitely think that two or three goals would do it and they would certainly shut shop when I look at Napoli's goals though it was definitely down to bad defending and it's easily to attribute that to Sari ball but I think also the inexperience of Delict specifically in playing in Italian football and the more tactical nature in comparison to Dutch football I think it might take them a bit more time to adapt to how Italian sides defend and what Italian coaches look at in, in a defender. So I think that might have uh, a part to do with it. Another thing to keep in mind is that two of the goals came from set pieces. So I think that's something Sari needs to work on before the club, the teams return from the international break because a top team like you always shouldn't be copying goals from set pieces, and when it's against Napoli, who is one of the stronger sides in Serie A, uh, that is a concern. I think as well, Vito, like De Ligt got a lot of stick um, after the game, or particularly, it was more so on social media than anything else, um, because like two of the goals were essentially like his fault completely. Um, and, and people kind of complaining about the, the money he's on, the money he cost. And it's just like, it's, that's his first game, his first <laughs> full start. Uh, and like you say, a brand new league, uh, with uh, with probably the the defensive partner is not going to have most of the time. It, pro- it probably would have played with Chiellini more often than not. So you've kind of he, he's learning everything's brand new for him. So I think people are starting to say he's, he's rubbish and all what he's overrated and all that. I think is a bit uh, disingenuous, but just because he made a couple of mistakes before that for an hour, it was fantastic. Yeah, I think it's it's quite clear that he has some work to do, which I don't think anyone will be surprised by, right? He's coming to a new league, he's still a kid, and he's playing with Benucci, not Chiellini. So there, there's still a lot of work to be done there for Delict, but he he showed last year the talent he has. He's going to be able to make that step. It's just maybe going to take him a little bit longer than a lot of people expected it to. Um, Gonzalo Higuain, oh, he, he played and he scored, and he looked like... He's not taken the last year off. He was very, very good. He rolled back the year's Cora Clancy. I couldn't believe it when he scored his goal. I was like, whoa, that came out of nowhere. Um, but yeah, he, he, I thought he had a... Again, he, I think it's been, for me, it was him and Kadira who were man of the match candidates. I think uh, Higuain got it because he scored. Kadira, all, well, Kadira should have had a goal. Um, and hit the bar. Least, but... Yeah. Um, but Higuain, I, I think there's well something that's very positive is the 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 partnership with Higuain and Cristiano Ronaldo because there were times in that game where Juventus were essentially playing a four four two, and you have Ronaldo and Higuain as the as the the front pair, and uh, they looked like they were quite happy to play together. There wasn't any moaning from Gonzalo, which is a miracle in itself. Um, he was working for the teams, obviously Ronaldo was as well. So it was. It was very different than than the Higuain that we have kind of become used to over the last couple of years, where all he did was moan his head off and was just a pain in the backside for everybody. And it looked like a change. It looked literally looked like the Gonzalo Higuain that scored what was it thirty four goals for Napoli. That was the Higuain that he looked like. Um, and I think he'll be Juventus' starting striker for the season. 
Yeah, well, that season where he scored 36, I thought that he, he often got quite, le- quite harshly criticised. And it's easy to say that Higuain does nothing other than score, but when he was at Napoli, he did work. He did drop back. He did fight. At Juve, maybe a little bit less so because he had Matsukic to do all of that for him. Mm. But if he needs to do it, I think he can do it. Whether or not he can still do that now, three years later, who knows? But it remains to be seen. That partnership that he's got with Cristiano Ronaldo is it looks like it's really developing because it was on show here in Parma as well. And Ronaldo was really poor last week, but there was still something there between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure he went off after about an hour or something last week, so he didn't get to see it for the full 90, but... Can you, can you remember, did Higuain play with Ronaldo at Real Madrid? Yeah, they did, yeah. Um, yeah, so m- m- maybe there. maybe that's what it is. There were kindred spirits for <laughs> their time at Real Madrid. Possibly. And then they're finally back together. Possibly. Um, speaking of Cristiano Ronaldo, he did a funny, I have a lot of time for his celebration. Because he scored his goal to make it 3-0. And he ran over and the fans were all like building in anticipation for his big jump. And he gave them a little smirk and drew the VAR signal and then said, like, everyone calm, everyone calm. Do you think that was because he went and did it in front of the Napoli fans, did he not? Or was uh, that it was him? Yeah, I yeah, think it was him. He, he ran over that way, but he looked very clear. He didn't look at them. Um, mm. But it was quite clearly because last week in Parma, he, he did his big celebration and everyone shouted the suit and then it was cancelled and it was mm. quite embarrassing for him. <laughs> But, Does it have in the bands, Conor Clancy? Did you like the bands? I, I I really had a lot of time for it. Because obviously it's funny to laugh at Cristiano sometimes, but I was very much laughing with him this week. It was, yeah, I liked that a lot. So top work, Cristiano. Forget the goal. <laughs> I, I like what you did there. Um, but let's speak about Napoli for a little bit. Because two of their new boys, actually three of their new boys, scored. Um, and Vito, there are some promising signs there, despite the heartbreak of the late defeat. They do have some potential in that squad, but uh, obviously they need to try and take that next step. Uh, that being said, I think the additions are pretty good. They'll, they'll make a difference further on. And uh, specifically Lozano. Uh, I must admit, I haven't watched too much of him play, but he's a quick little customer. Uh, I think uh, he'll add another dimension to... Napoli's play, and I think with his speed, he can unsettle a few defences. While Di Lorenzo, he got the equaliser for 3 all, And I was impressed with him at Empoli, mostly for his attacking play, of course. But I do think he gives more in the offensive phase than what uh, Hussai has given them in the last couple of years. It's quite strange with Napoli's two fullbacks, isn't it? Because Hussai and Gulam, as you've mentioned, Dov, They've both just deteriorated so, so quickly and so dramatically. And well, it's really it's, detrimental to that team. Well, it's kind of like for two different reasons. Um, Gulam hasn't um, recovered from the, in- the knee injury that he had. Um, and Mario Rui is just not very good. So you've kind of got problems there. Um, and then Di Lorenzo, yeah, he, 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 the first half he wasn't that good but obviously in the, in the second kind of with the whole Napoli team got a lot better and whose side doesn't want to be there mm. so you've kind of got kind of different issues on both sides um, I, I think what should be Napoli's biggest strength is through this through the middle with Manolas and Koulibaly in the centre that, that literally should be rock solid and it's conceded what seven goals in two games like that's that, that's that, that you're talking Sampdoria levels of crap with that pairing, like, and, that, and it shouldn't be that. And the thing is, as well, like they, they look, they don't even look solid. They they look like you could kind of just almost walk through them at, at times. They look all over the shop, and I think that's something that I would expect them to to kind of have sorted out already. And because Manolas has played in Serie A for a good number of years, obviously Koulibaly has been in that team for a good number of years as well. They're not 20 years old. They're kind of almost in the peak of their career, starting that peak period. So I would expect them to be a lot more solid or look a lot more solid in what they do. And I think that's what would worry me um, for with Angelotti. And the fact that Manolas has been at Napoli for a while now, he wasn't a late signing this summer. So they, they've had the time to gel. So, and especially with Alan and Zielinski in front of them, it's not like they're 
being left completely exposed. It just feels like it's not quite clicked into gear yet at Napoli this season. Um, but they're still providing entertainment. So as a neutral, they're quite fun to watch. And they'll definitely be giving us plenty to talk about this season one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Where should we go next? What we're going to do now is... For everyone who's listening to the audio version, you're going to hear us talking about the Derby della Capitale in Rome, where Lazio and Roma drew one each. And we had Alistair McKenzie there, so I'm going to disappear and speak to him. And if you're just watching on YouTube, go over to Spotify, (laughs) Acast, iTunes, wherever you like to get your podcasts, and go and download the Forza Italian Football Podcast, because you're not going to get everything on YouTube this year. We're not spoon-feeding you as spoon much footing. I, I, yeah, I, I can't spoon even footed. speak. It's late. <laughs> Vito, it's do you want hot. spoon footed? I'm tired. I'm oh. happy it's the international break. Oh, here we go. Buy a file and out for Cora Clancy, everybody. <laughs> um, right. He's had to now, work for two weeks. <laughs> can, can, you, can you quieten down for a minute, please? Because oh, we're going to go to Sardinia, where your your team, Inter, Dov, um, they, they beat Cagliari 2 1. It didn't. It didn't always look like it was going to come there were some unsavory incidents as we always seem to get in Cagliari this time but uh, to be honest I'm not bothered talking about them because we've spoken about them enough last season that I think we'll give it a miss this week well what you should what you should say is it's the same thing that happens every year and nothing gets done about it and the most ironic thing which I, I find I actually find it hilarious. As you know how Syria is having their anti-piracy campaign yeah. right now. And yeah. then when everybody on social media was pointing out all these racist chants, they blocked the video. Yeah. Like, well, how, how stupid can you be? It's unbelievable. Like, like seriously, obviously they, they put out their, their usual, yeah, we are against racism things, but nothing will happen. You know nothing will happen. I know nothing will happen. Vito knows nothing will happen. And everybody listening to this knows nothing will happen because nothing ever happens. And that's it. End of story. Right. We should say, um, it doesn't take much imagination. Cagliari fans did monkey noises at Romelu Lukaku before he took a penalty. He scored the penalty and the monkey noises amplified. Lovely people. But I was was happy he scored that penalty, to be honest with you. Um, But yeah, what can you do? Uh, Adam Digby actually put up a video. And it took Serie A an hour and 22 minutes to have the video deleted. So, see, the, see the, the thing is as well, like if you keep putting up the videos, because what, what would be the obvious thing to do would be to keep re- uploading the videos, but then eventually you're, you're going to get your social media accounts taken away through excessive copyright strikes. So <laughs> it's just, there's, like, literally, like, obviously you want to kind of draw attention to it, and I think uh, it was drawn attention to it, but it's just literally for nothing. Attention was drawn to it when Ken was abused last year as well. Nothing happened. But Cagliari's statement was, did you see this? It was embarrassing. You're going to tell us what it was, aren't uh, you? Because well, see, Cagliari what... basically went on to say they strongly condemn any racist abuse and they will work with the relevant authorities to find who did it. And then they said, oh, but for the most part, um, Cagliari and Inter fans actually sat in the oh, same yeah. stand and had yeah. fun together watching this game. Oh. Okay. I think I think that's maybe a, a, a poor way of saying it was only a small minority. Yeah, but they tried. <laughs> they just didn't do it in the, the 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 best way. They didn't express themselves in the best way. And the English version um, was Google translated. It looked like oh, absolutely. Yeah, the English version was horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> but ah, uh, I don't know. It's look, we've spoken about this enough times. Everyone knows what's happening. Everyone knows nothing's going to happen about it. So. I'll just move on and moan about it again in two weeks when someone else is the victim of it. But um, big Romelu Lukaku, Dov, he got another goal and he's off to a flyer. He is. He's all right, yeah. He's a good player. Better than Icardi. That's what I'm <laughs> Steady. Better, better, better than Icardi. Um, Nicer I, than Icardi. Well, yeah, that's right. right. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of hand over to Vito on this and see if he agrees with me that um, the the Antonio Conte way, because everybody talks about how Sarri ball is amazing and all this and that's entertaining and all that rubbish. Um, the, the Conte ball of just grinding teams down until they give up and you eventually win is a, a good thing for Inter. 
I reckon it suits the place that he has at his disposal and what they've purchased throughout the summer is ideal for the way Contest sets up his teams. Uh, Contest style might not be the most pleasing on the own, like, say, Sari Ball, but it is effective. And his teams do have an attacking intent, but his football is based on work ethic and organisation. So the way he plays is it's a bit different to what Italian teams are used to, but what you'll get from an Antonio Contest side is that they'll, you know, use that cliched 110% or anything like that. They will work harder than usual and really drain the energy out of the opposition. And that's what this Inter team will be set out to do. And I think they've got a clearer and more coherent plan than what they did under Luciano Spalletti. I think the problem is now that they've lost Icardi, they've lost their heart, their soul, the former captain. One does not there anymore. <laughs> it's going to be sad. What we're going to talk Nick about? Icardi must just free everybody else, though. Like the rest of those players must be quite happy to see the back of them. I think. So. I think everybody is. I think the club is, is especially because I look like was it earlier on what, like last week <laughs> it had a meeting and it basically decided nah I'm staying and you're getting sued and I want 1.5 million euros and I want to be back in the team thank you very much yeah. it's like, who, like honestly like, who does this guy think he is he's yeah. clearly an idiot like, I don't know who's the bigger idiot her or him because yeah. um, there was even the talk that there was the talk that she was trying to persuade him to leave and he was like no no I want to stay I want to stay this is I was like what like what on earth I don't, I don't, honestly, just what on earth is he thinking about? So I think um, when that went through today, I think everybody in Inter is just relieved yeah. that he's gone um, and they, they don't need this speaker. This will, this will be the last time we'll ever be mentioned on this podcast. No, it ever. won't. I love his Instagram. I'll be keeping tabs, don't oh, worry. Um, but I was, I was quite sad when he left on a personal note because... We get a little bit of content out of Mario Cardi and he's interesting. But then I thought, where's he gone? Oh, he's going to be playing alongside Neymar, Edinson Cavani and Kylian Mbappe. He'll find a way to fight with people there. So that'll be well, funny. Did you not see, I think it was, I, I, I can't remember exactly what this was, but I think it was a picture of Maxi Lopez and Neymar yeah. together. <laughs> I was just like, oh Too Christ, he's not, he's not even there yet. It's like but, they're together. Team Maxi, by the way. Hashtag Team Maxi. 100%. Maxi Lopez <laughs> trolled him. It was five hours before the move went through. Maxi Lopez was posting a picture with his pal. I think he said, my brother Neymar. I love that. <laughs> Neymar's Team Maxi. They, 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 oh, honestly, it's going to be... It's, Paris Saint-Germain's going to be fun. Yeah. Go. The league you know can have some fun though. with that. Icardi goes there, winds everybody up. They don't exercise the purchase option and this time next year he ends up back at Inter going through the same thing because he extended his contract by a year he did he did yeah <laughs> I love that club and I love him and I love Wanda just together separately I'm not too fond of any of them but put them all in one big melting pot and it's it's fascinating I love it um Lautaro Martinez he also scored Vito he's up and running he's gonna have a flying season I think this will be his true breakthrough year this time. The, the two-man attack probably suits him more than playing as a lone striker. And he was probably a bit unlucky not to score a couple of times against Lecce last week. He probably would have had an, a hat-trick or even a poke, as they say in Italy, if he converted his chances. But finally, he took one against the, the Sardinians. And, yeah, again, hopefully for Inter's sake, he can maintain that form because... With the arrival of Alexis Sanchez, Martinez will have to do what he can to maintain his spot in the starting eleven. Are you going to talk about the transfer market now, Conor Clancy, or are we doing that later? Uh, I was going to just do a quick roundup of it later on. All right, we do, you can do your quick roundup, but one thing I will say is Inter smashed this transfer window out of the park. They just destroyed it. They went transfer window. Thank you very much. We'll see you later. Yeah, that's they've awesome. done very, very well this summer. Um, but they'll still just finish second and do nothing in Europe. Um, right, the other half of Milan. Milan beat Brescia 1-0. Dov, were you there for this one? I wasn't. Vieri Capretto was there. So he was. So we're not going to speak about this game. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna listen to me speak to Vieri Capretto about this game. 
I gave him a call earlier, and here's what he had to say. All right, that's what Vieri Cabretta thought of the game at San Siro. I'm quite jealous that I wasn't there. But what's next up? Dov, where were you? Genoa Fiorentina. Um, Fiorentina mm-hmm. haven't won. They haven't picked up a point yet. But they've played Genoa, and, and they've, they've not got a point. I thought they were supposed to be good this year, Dov. Uh, You've seen the, them play twice. Yeah, I've seen them both games. I mean... I think last week I was raving about them because they looked a lot better. They looked like there's belief in the team. There all the youngsters there. Kind of the atmosphere, similar to Inter, the atmosphere around the club has changed. But oh Christ, against Genoa, they were hopeless. I think uh, I think they had like like Boateng had a shot in the first couple of minutes. They went just wide, and after that, they really didn't do anything until the last um, 15 minutes when they scored the penalty, and that was that was about it. It was uh, those two teams. Like I think I mentioned this um, during the game. Those two teams essentially avoided relegation like by the skin of their teeth last year, the two of them. Um, and Genoa look a lot better. They look like they've improved a lot. And even then, they didn't have about maybe three or three starters that will play in that team as well. Um, and obviously, they got the, the the draw away at Roma the week before. And for me, they were the much better team. Um, Christian Kouame, I know yes. that I spoke about him last week. Christ almighty, he is good. Um, <laughs> he is brilliant. Let's and he talk is about be one moment in particular. There's that a, goal. Yeah, it's fantastic. Touch. The ball's come about 70 yards and dropped out of the air and he's and just, just killed went, it. Yeah, exactly. Just like literally where he wanted to go. And he's... Like I, I, I was speaking to Alistair about it about this before the game, and he wasn't conv- he's not convinced about him. He thinks he needs to add goals. So obviously, he got a lovely uh, tweet after that going in. Mm-hmm. Um, and you would, I think, you maybe have expected him last season when he was kind of running towards a goal to pass it or fall over or something like that. But no, he just rifled it in the uh, bottom corner. A br- absolutely brilliant goal. Yeah, uh, uh, it was a very confident finish as well. Really yeah. Really and- He's kind of leading that line with uh, with with Pinamonte as well, who looked good, and the fullbacks, uh, Barreca's one and Grioni on the other side. Again, the two of them looked really good as well, um, and Shona adding steel to the midfield. Um, I think to wind Vito up, just because everybody <laughs> likes it when I wind people up. Um, Genoa are going to finish above Sampdoria, and I reckon they could be the uh, the surprises this season. Um, Zapata scored. With uh, <laughs> and he's got Christian like Christian Zapata, who was crap at Milan, decided to be a defender again. Um, and Christian Romero, who's obviously going to be on his way to Juve, like the two of them, you've got the, the, them at the back, it's, it's they've got everything. And Cristiano as well, they've got a solid defense, good young goalkeeper, decent full backs, and then two young, hungry strikers in there, and, and solid midfielder. I think they'll, they'll do really well. I really, I'm, I'm like, impressed. Very, impressed. I really like Cristiano slotting in as a a left-sided of a three now. Mm. Obviously, he was more of an attacking player on the left wing back in his youth. And even last season when he first came, I was, I don't know how many times I was in Genoa for the first couple of months of the season, but it seemed to be Mm. every other week. And he was always just bombing up and down the wing. And you could see by the end of the game, it had taken its toll on him. So it's nice to see (laughs) that he's kind of just slotting in there so seamlessly. He's a player that I quite like. Um, especially in his older years now that he's got that experience behind him. But. Yeah, I, cause I was trying. I, I didn't do it because I'm lazy, but I was gonna. I was gonna have a look and see um, what the average age is of the Genoa team when you take away like like essentially the spine, and uh, the, the, most of them um, are in their early twenties as well. Like there's not there there are only like maybe two or three of the actual starters who are into their thirties, and I think that's. Good for the club as well because they've been kind of floundering around for a good wee while now, and it seems like under Andrea Zoli they've kind of got a bit more of a, a direction. Um, and I think, yeah, like I say, they're going to be the surprise this season. Yeah, it's probably just Zapata, Crescito, and Radovanovic that are in their thirties out of that starting eleven, right? But then they do have Goran Pandev, who brings the average age of the squad up by about seventy-two <laughs> years. So. <laughs> Yes, that, isn't <laughs> this is true. This is true. There is yeah. always that, but yeah, Genoa could be one to watch this year, Dov. I think you might be onto something there. Fiorentina won't be though. Fiorentina are rubbish. Oh, where are they going to finish this year? Go on, well, give us a number. Well, Vieri, Vieri in his preview said that if they get 
10th or above, it'll be a miracle. And kind of seeing how bad they are at the back, I think that's that's um, possibly correct. Um, it seems like they've signed names rather than ability in terms of Ribery and Boating. They didn't do too much when they were on the park, apart like I think. But I think both of them had one decent shot each, and that was about it. Um, so um, uh, uh, that that club's got a lot of work to do. Um, they brought in another striker on deadline day because that's the area of the squad they really need to address, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's, it's, they don't create enough. I mean, they've got Chiesa there, and um, they've got Sotil. He's twenty years old. Um, Boateng thinks he's a striker, but he's not really, and it doesn't really work. I think there was one point I was watching him, and he was like, he was shouting for the ball, and then somebody passed it to him. And he just kind of like I went, I went maybe a yard away from where he wanted it, and he just went <sighs> and just started flopping. I was like, "What? Are you like you shouldn't be doing that. You're not there to do that." Um, but yeah, I, I'm honestly like th- this week I was not impressed. The heart that they showed last week kind of disappeared. Um, although like M- Mr. Rocco, Rocco was there at the Ferraris. He was loving it. Um, went up to the fans and stuff. It was sad, just a wee bit down for me as well. Um, and he got in my way when I was trying to leave the stadium. That was annoying. Mm. Yeah, I, had to, I, to I had to say, excuse me. I said <laughs> that, obviously. And then some women got in my way. What was annoying? Because then he's just standing there, like, waving. And he was, what, what was he doing? He was just like, oh, no, what can we do? Like, sorry. And I'm like, yeah, get out of the way. Go, go and do something else. You, you could buy the right players. Yeah, go and buy, go and buy something. They've got, they've, they've got Dalbert. I'll be fine. I've got Dalbert. Oh, oh yeah. Problem solved. Sort of. Um, to mm. the other side of that city, not Florence, I mean Genova, Sampdoria. Were you, well, were you there, Cora Clancy? Uh, I was there. I was, in, I was in Reggio Emilia for this. Your favourite place? Um, <laughs> it's absolutely not my favourite place. Probably the worst place I've been to in this fine country, but that's, that's for another podcast. Um, Sampdoria, guys, they are horrid. I mean, when they have the ball, they're okay. And I, I don't mean they're terrible, they're not good, they're okay. But as soon as they lose possession, you just expect the other team to score. Jason Murillo and Omar Colley, I said it last week, I said it before the season, Jason Murillo and Omar Colley cannot play together for a season for a team that doesn't want to get relegated. I mean, they're horrid. Murillo summed up his entire career with Sassuolo's opener. Because Chicha Caputo got the ball. Well, he didn't even have the ball. It was kind of a, a 60-40 in favour of Caputo. Inside Sassuolo's own half, out on the touchline. And what does Murillo do? Anything a, a good centre-half would do, right? Just, just dive in. Just completely dived in. Caputo skinned them. And then Sassuolo broke. I think it was like four on three. Obviously, they scored from that. And every time the ball went near the box, it was just chaos. Samp don't know what they're doing. They've no one to take control. and. It's going to be a long season for the Blue Cicchiati. Vito, you could do it someone like Edgar Barreto protecting that defence right now. I think at the moment, he might have to be brought in and I think he might be better suited to Di Francesco's uh, uh, ideas. But uh, I think after the international break, Di Francesco has to scrap the 4-3-3 because he simply does not have the squad to play that formation. And at Sassuolo and Roma, when the 4-3-3 formation didn't work, he would change to 3-5-2 and he'd sort out the defence because, as you mentioned, Mario and Colli are horrible defenders. So if they put Alex Ferrari to help them in the back three and Barreto to join them in the midfield and... He'll drop back because that's his main point, to help win back the ball. Uh, That might improve things, but with the signing Sump have made this uh, summer, I think it's going to be a very tough six months unless Gianluca Vialli and York Capital Management are able to complete a deal to buy the club off Massimo Ferrero. Under Ferrero, it does look like we'll be relegation contenders. And I don't blame Di Francesco entirely because... He can only do so much with the players at his disposal. To be fair to Alex Ferrari, when he came in, things did 
solidify a bit. And this is a 25 year old, and he shouldn't be responsible for organizing that defense. But he did. Um, it's just, it's a mess. Even if Gianluca Viali and Co come in, they can't do anything until January. So it's just going to be a long thing. few months. Vito, I, I you don't know, blame. What? What I was going to say, what is it going to happen? Is it going to go through? I mean, or is it just kind of speculation still? Because I, I think you've been saying this is when they buy is like, is assuming it's like done, but is it done? It doesn't look like it's going to be going through anytime soon. No, because it has dragged on for several months. So I'm out to loss as much as anyone, to be perfectly honest. And various media outlets, they report, oh, about to do it but i see no official statements from the club so i'm getting tagged by some of my followers on social media oh what do you think about this it's finally done and i go easy guys it's not done yet wait for an official statement then i'll give a proper opinion well ferrero's got the club i'm not gonna get carried away because i did get carried away when he did buy the club he generated some good excitement at the start, but then it came to the point he's just a glorified version of the Garone family and he's just maintaining the same model Sump has had since the turn of the century. It's troubling because you have to feel for Eusebio Di Francesco as well. He said in his post-match press conference that he was, he was pissed off, he was sorry, he was sorry, he was sorry, but then he went on to say that I'm not happy in general. We... Then he was asked about Emiliano, Emiliano Rigoni, who is now there. This was before he signed. He said, well, well, he's not enough. We don't need another attacking player. We need players everywhere else. But the club have given me this guy who they've already got players for that position. They, they need a defender. They need a midfielder. They probably need a goalkeeper, but they've not been given them. And I don't know what Ferrero actually expects because Di Francesco can't do anything if he's been given. It's like the Fiorentina situation. They've got this top-heavy side, but attacking is all well and good, but you need someone down the other end to give your attackers a chance well, to you, win you, the game. You even suggested, Connor, that like he might jump before he's pushed. Yeah, well, he, it seemed that way. He was, he was really annoyed, <laughs> and you can't blame him. He got the impression that he came in, was told, yeah, we'll get you a few players because he said I, I made my requests clear to the club I said we needed this we needed this we needed this but they, ha- they haven't arrived and it, it was hard not to feel sorry for him to be honest because if you identify these areas and your defensive reinforcement is Jason Murillo I mean what hope have you got really and <laughs> this I don't know. I, I really feel for Di Francesco because he was kind of dealt a harsh hand at Roma as well. And now he's... Or, or you could look at it on the other way, Carl Clancy, and say, it's just not very good. No, but I think he was always overrated. Over, no, I hate the word overrated. He was always overhyped and oversold a little bit before Roma. But then Roma were a mess last year, right? Because Di Francesco went and then what was it? About five days later, Monchi went. So... If Monchi's to blame, then Di Francesco couldn't have been to blame. And if Di Francesco's to blame, then Monchi probably shouldn't have been to blame. So for the two of them to go at the same time was a bit strange for me. But mm. what, about, um, right. what about Player of the Week? Who got Player of the Week on Forza? Ah, uh, Domenico Baraggi, but he wasn't very good. Um, scored, why he got Player of the Week? How can he not be good and get Player of the Week? This is ridiculous. He, he scored he's three sacked. goals against a non-existent defence. His third goal was very, very good. Um, but his first was Chicha Caputo and Jason Murillo teaming up to give him all the space in the world for a tap-in. His second was a header after Alfred Duncan, who I loved, put a cross in for him. And then the third goal, he picked it up out on the right, about 25 yards from goal, cut in onto his left and just whipped it. Uh, there, I had no chance. But yeah, he, that's basically all he did. Um, he, he came alive for 16 minutes and then disappeared again. But Variety does this, right? It was kind of a, his career in microcosm. He popped up and did look really good for a bit and then didn't really do all that You're much. You're a hard man to please, Conor Clancy. Oh, no, I just want you to be involved. But yeah, he got a hat trick. I can't criticize him. But um, Chicha Caputo was far more impressive for me, as was, um, oh, I've forgotten his last name, Junior Traore. He looked quite exciting. Alfred Duncan's always good. And Jeremy Bogo was exciting when he came off the bench. Qualiorella got a goal, obviously. Penalty. 
Lampard aren't going to score any goals that aren't from Quali Rella this season. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a long year for Samp. Um, right, where next? I don't, do we have to talk about anything else? Bologna beat Spal in the Emilia Romagna, Emilia Romagna derby. Vito, we want to talk about Riccardo Orsolini. And when I say we, I mean you. You love him. I think he's a very promising young winger. And since Sinisa Mihalovic became the, po- the coach of uh, Bologna, he's really been involved in the play and been integral to the uh, attacks. He provides goals and set up goals. And, yeah, he was the one that provided the winner for Roberto Soriano. So I think he's someone with a lot of upside. And he's in the Italy under-21 squad, but I think he's someone that can make the jump to the senior squad in the near future. He's someone that I really hope Mihalovic gets his hands on because there is talent there. But every time I went to Bologna last season... I don't want season, him to go to jail, Clancy. Christ, on yeah. <laughs> Well, Mihalovic looked like he would go to jail if he had gotten his hands on him at points last season. There was that game against Empoli where Bologna basically sealed their survival. I think Empoli went one or two up and Bologna came back. I can't remember what happened, but anyway. And Riccardo Borsellini was the best and worst player on the pitch. And he got a goal in the end, but he nearly cost Bologna there. Sorry, I asked that. Last mm. season. And I do think he has a lot of maturing to do. And How, ca- how come we're not talking about Atalanta getting smashed off the We're window? getting there. We're going oh. there next, don't worry. But yeah, there is you... there is a signing that I completely missed this summer. Gary Medell's at Bologna. Yeah, it just happened last week. I missed that. That's Did you miss that? Fantastic. I'm going to go and try and speak to him this season, I think, because that'd be fun. Talk about going to prison. He'd probably go to prison if you asked him a question. Did you see the wee video they put up? No. When they signed him, oh, it was a wee silly video of like a poodle or something like that. And you know, I was called the pit bull. Yeah. And I had a crowd. It was rubbish. Oh. Uh, it's it it basically Bologna trying to be Roma's Twitter account, but not doing it very well. Oh. That's uh, a shame. Yeah, um, I, I'm not. I'm not really liking that. Right, let's come to Parma then, shall we? We're at the Parma. No, oh, oh, yeah, it was in Parma. They were beaten three. Well, they played. A, yeah, they played in Parma as a home game, and they were beaten three two by Torino because they always lose to Torino. So there are no problems here, dog. Don't you worry. Um, <laughs> Kevin Bonifazzi scored the opener. Duvan Zapata got two. One of those was very very nice. Then Berenguer scored, and then Armando Izzo the the killer of Atalanta. He scored a winner against him last season. He did it again this year. Let's start on a positive note. Armando Izzo is very, very good. But is Torino is ceiling? Because he's not good enough for a big club, especially because none of the big clubs play with a back three. So Torino or Atalanta is probably about his peak, though, right? Mm, yeah, I remember when, when he came through at Genoa. Um, I remember watching him there and I was thinking, this guy's going to be... A, a, a good defender. I thought he could be a lot better than what he is. Definitely an Italian international. Um, I think he's had a few issues with uh, the old illicit substances and some um, not very <laughs> some off-field problems. Let's just say that, uh, which I think kind of halted his progress. But I think he's highly rated and kind of with him and Inculo to like the two best defenders for Torino, obviously. So yeah, I think he's. Possibly hit his ceiling. Um, I think he, he should try a, a better club and see if he can do it. But I mean, it can't be worse than like Musaccio or somebody like that in Milan. So, like, uh-huh. why not? Like, go go and try your luck at a bigger team and see what you can do. Because if you look at some of the centre backs that um, are kicking around, like he's he's better than Ranocchia, for yeah. example, at Inter. So, I mean, he's kind of. Not on the top tier of Serie A defenders, but I think he's probably in that second tier quite comfortably. For me, yeah, easily he'd be he'd be fun in the Conte team. I just thought Inter play with a back three. There you go. You should there. You go. Should go there. Get ready. Diego Godin. 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 Moves on. Godin's Godin. <laughs> yeah. and get Itzo. Right. There you go. Do a little swap there. Get rid of the frog and Godin and get get Itzo in. That'd be a lot better off for it. Um, but dog, Atlanta are crap, mate. Atlanta they're not are crap. rubbish. They're not crap. Done, I said finished. this to you, when was it last last week? They were 2 0 down at Spal, and I messaged you to say, Well, Atalanta usually don't show up for the first five games of the season anyway. So mm. they just tricked everyone last week, but now they're going to take a five game break and then they'll start playing in October again. So 
Don't worry about it. But okay. it is a strange game because Atalanta did do their usual thing where uh, we'll dominate it, but we'll just forget to score and we'll be all right, won't we? But Zapata got two and Torino came back. It was strange, but Maziello came out after the game and basically said, we do this all the time, um, which I quite like. They know what their problems are. They're just not bothered addressing them. Mm. Like, we keep giving the same mistakes to teams and they punish us and we know about it, but it just keeps happening. Like, oh. Yeah, so you know about it. You're playing in the Champions League this year. Maybe try and address some of those, but I don't know. It's hard to be too critical of them, given all but, of the- Yeah, that you like them a lot. Yeah, so you're not going to be critical. Nah, I'm critical of different parts of the club, but the on-field things, they finished third last year. Third. They'll finish in the top six again this year. Don't worry about it. They'll be all right. Um, so we can move away from Atalanta Torino. Duvan Zapata scored his first two goals of the season, so he's going to score 20 again this year. Udinese went one nice. Palma. Yeah, it was a very good goal. He absolutely bullied, I can't remember the defender, but he just... Not Armando Izzo. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no one bullies Armando Izzo. But um, Udinese went one up against Parma, and I was a bit worried for my relegation prediction, but then Parma came back. Gervinho, Galliolo and Inglese... All scored, finished 3-1, but Dejan Kuluzewski assisted twice. He's how, a long did, how long did it take you to practice that one? Um, after the preview <laughs> part, I said his name about 10 times in the mirror, and I think he cracked it. But <laughs> don't let the mind the same. Um, Vito, Parma, they're up and running. They've got their win. Uh, they will probably a bit unlucky not to get something out of the Juve game, although Juve on paper, definitely the much better squad. But this time, I think it was really good that they did get three points on the road and someone who we expect to be a relegation contender. And needless to say, Jovinho was the real difference maker, especially with the equaliser. And he also played a part in Inglese's goal as well. So for Parma to do well, they obviously need him to be firing on all cylinders. And when he can do something for the team, not just do everything by himself, uh, I think he can really make a real difference for the Ducali. Yeah, even even in Glazer's third goal, though, Jovino got uh, an assist kind of by fluke because he just tried to overcomplicate things. And even the pass to Inglese didn't really give Inglese that much to aim at. And I, I thought Bobby did very well to, to finish that. But he did. Yeah. The difference maker is never Jovino. You know, come on, you know better than that. Bruno Alves, always. Doesn't matter if he scores or not. He's he's the difference for Palma. What else was there? Uh, I'm looking at all the fixtures. Lecce. The Lecce Verona, right? We're not gonna talk about this, but Matteo Pasina, aka new Pornhub ambassador. Have you guys seen <laughs> this? By the way? Have yeah, you yeah. right, well if you have and you're listening. Matteo Pessina, Atalanta guy, Atalanta, Atalanta midfielder, was pictured arriving back for the first day of preseason training carrying a Pornhub um, like bag. So then Pornhub obviously got in touch and they sent him loads of gear. They sent him a hat, a jumper, a t-shirt, socks, bags. So a few Atalanta fans online have nicknamed him Pornhub, which is just beautiful. He went to Verona a couple of days ago and he scored at Lecce and he didn't celebrate he scored a goal on his like he's gonna have a breakthrough season this year and he scored and he, he held his hands up like this and I was thinking well, what's he doing that for I checked because he used to play for Lecce mate. he played three games on loan there four years ago right but that's, that's enough that, I, these days that's enough that is ridiculous like if he set foot on uh, for in the stadium of a team once mm then you, you can't celebrate. It's not yeah, allowed. I think if I managed to be a professional footballer and then scored against Monopoly, I couldn't celebrate because I visited there this summer. So, so you're you not see, allowed to do that if you go So somewhere. you say he played, what, three games? Do you know how many minutes it was? Uh, probably under 30. No, no, no. It was more than that. All right. Uh, 100, 160. Uh, so he right, played so less, less than, than two games. Two games. <laughs> right. That's a disgrace. I like Pacina. I tipped him as my player to watch this season as well. But he's already annoyed me and it's the first time I've seen him play. So Ooh. we don't want to see that, Matteo. But any more that for celebration, for that? that was Quayarella esque. You yeah. expect that from Quayarella. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Right. Is there anything you guys particularly want to speak about in the transfer? Transfers, mate. It's transfers. Yeah, but what? Transfers. Who did the best transfer market? Oh, sorry. Breaking news. April Summers is piping up about Mario Icardi's move to Paris. What is she saying? She says, hashtag Icardi stays with hashtag Inter, but on loan to hashtag PSG. Um, Icardi at Paris, Icardi PSG. You will be mi- You will be so missed, baby. And a little almost <laughs> crying emoji where she is standing naked. You, you know, you know the, the worst bit of all this, the fact that you follow April Summers. I don't, actually. I'm going to see. So how did it come up? That's what everybody wants. Uh, how did under it the cosh retweeted it onto my timeline. So blame right. them, right. not me. But, right, under the cosh. You are under yeah. the cosh. Yeah, I'm going to have uh, right. to Transfers. Do transfers. Who did the best transfer window? Inter, obviously. Right, who did the worst? Um, ooh, Atalanta. Yeah, they, signed, they signed Martin Skirtle for a week, so they did the worst. Yeah, but they've got someone here now as well, and they signed Arana. They've got Lewis Murray. They've done all right, just not. Why did they get players. rid of Martin Skirtle, Cora Clancy? Why? <laughs> well, he he's he's got to there. He's got to take them to the Champions League and lead the team forward. Apparently, Dov, he it didn't take him too long to realize that he's not good enough and that he doesn't fancy himself to play in a back three. So he was left out of the squad for the Torino game. And that kind of raised a lot of signals and alarms were ringing. But yeah, um, basically, he wasn't as good as they expected him to be. And then it was only like, what, two weeks in? And then he went to Gasparini and said, look, I don't think I'm cut out for this back three business. Then Gas was like, okay, do you want to go? And he said, yeah. So now he's gone back to Turkey. But we'll see him play against the Serie A team. Is it Lazio? Uh, is it League? I don't know uh, about the Europa League this year. I'm concentrating on the big one. Oh, I can't remember. I, was, I, was, I, think, I think it's Roma they've got. I can't remember. The Istanbul team. I've just realised my. I'm still on April Summers' as Twitter timeline. So right, get off April Summers. You're I'm off. Dirty, um, dirty. Right. Like, who did Roma's business is suspect? They've signed Chris Smalling. What's like, that about? He's going to make that defense rock solid. <laughs> but that, that's a strange deal. I they've mean, got they've got an Atalanta defense pretty much though. They've got what Zappa Costa, Spinazzola, Mancini. Yeah. They just need to who, who, stand like, in front of. Yeah, so it's like they basically got Atalanta like three years ago. Yeah, because they, they saw Milan do that and they thought, oh, that, that went really well. We should do that. Mm. And then... That didn't work. No. <laughs> they need to do take Gasparini if they want to take Atalanta's players, but why would he do that? Um, but do you want to say anything about the transfers? Or are you just going to shout transfers? No, I'm just going to... Sh- transfers, transfers. Say something, I don't know. Like, Vito, tell me who, who had the worst transfer window, Vito? Um, uh, it would be easier to think of who would be the worst aside from Sump no, <laughs> no, 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 Vito, who, who's but the worst? Yeah, Sump, tell me who's no, the worst. I will say Sump. Sam Doria, the worst, aren't they, Vito? Terrible. Yeah. Well, they did buy three or four players from your beloved Kiev, who are no longer in Serie A. So <laughs> what's the logic behind that? This is we, not we, the we Del developed. Neri vintage. Redeveloping, it's all right. It's, 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 you'll, be, you'll be joining us next season there anyway, so don't worry, Vito. Um, oh, Ferrero still there, yeah, for sure. But uh, <laughs> I might have to. While I'm there, I might have to go to the Corte Lambruschi, give a knock on the door. I'll give him some advice. <laughs> Christ, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> right. What about right? Who's the who's the best signing of the summer? Oh. Ooh. Stefano Ooh. Sensi is going to be one of them, isn't he? It's like that. Like a early day, but I, think I, he's lo- I love him and I love Nicola Barella. So I prefer Barella, but it looks like Sensi is going to be more integral to Conte's system. So I'm going to say Sensi. And yeah, Sensi for now. Give me another minute to think. Not Rebic at Milan, no. Well, Milan don't have a good track record of doing good things with good players at this <laughs> time. So I'm going to say no. Look at poor Andrew. I reckon. Well. Mm-hmm. I reckon Nandes for Cagliari, who's coming to replace Barella, I think he might be having a good season too. I think uh, uh, European audiences might not be that aware of him, but I think uh, he'll show why he was at Boca Juniors. And 
I, when I saw him at the World Cup last year, I thought he was a good player for Uruguay. So, yeah. Nahi Tenendez, he'll be one to watch out for too. Uh, that's the other one as well. The Japanese guy, Bologna, but Tomiyasu, he's only 20 years old. He's good, yeah. He could be a good wee one as well. And for their, for their social media and marketing as well. Yeah. Which yeah, I'm sure they, they, will not for, yeah, they will not be forgetting about that. Um, and um, UV is an obvious one with Ramsey and Rabiot once they Yeah, well, they, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? Like, mm. I mean, they always do it. They did, they did a good ins, but crap outs. Cause yeah, they, I was about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, the they, outs. They have a lot of dead wood there. But like, yeah. like, like, like everybody, like what you would say, pretty much everybody's improved bar Milan. And obviously, in like in terms, of, in terms of the top teams. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, well, like you've even improved Inter definitely. Lazio haven't done that much. But they've got better. Lazio will be good. Yeah, they've got better yeah. Lazaris in. Um, who have adds. That's it. Yeah, well, Ever. that's that's the thing. So they've got a little bit better. Like they're not. Yeah. They don't need to revamp. So they've got a wee bit better, and they've kept the continuity. Um, Napoli, you would, on paper they should be better. I think Napoli honest. have done well with Di Lorenzo and Manolas. Well, yeah, well, that that's not really working out for them. It's two games. Lozano as well. That's mm. good. So we'll see how that works. Um, Roma, no. You don't think Roma have got better than last season? No. Do you not think so? They've got Mkhitaryan. Mkhitaryan might be a good signing, but I'm not sure. I think Smalling. Roma might be better Smalling. than they were last year just because the players that they they had. Like I'm looking at Zaniola Clivert under Cristante and Pellegrini. That's that could be a core five, right? And mm-hmm. they're just a little bit older and a little bit more experienced now. Mm-hmm. Um, I rate Mancini, obviously, but I'm not quite sold that I'm in a back three with not that much protection in front, or in a back two without mm-hmm. that much protection in front of them. That's why They've Chris Smalling's there. They don't, they don't have Robin Olsen anymore, which is good. That's good. Obviously. Pablo Pérez is good. But they They've still got, have... Imagine Andy. Juan Jesus and Chris Smalling. What? That is rock solid. <laughs> Nobody's getting past that. Yo, Nobody. You know what? A rock is it, it's a really hard thing it's not soft and easy to break through you know this right i'll be all right don't worry fancy was there honestly but you're 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 selling roma down the river i'll tell you um they'll do that to themselves they've got very two good yeah it'll be all right um, they've got they they he's saying Nicola oh, Callan. Oh, yeah right i knew there was one i was forgetting that's amazing who thinks that's a good idea in 2019, was it who was it? I, I don't know if it was you. Somebody tweeted that if you need, if you have players you don't want for Roma, they'll take them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> Atletico have been trying to get rid of Kalinic for three months, and nobody's like, like, nah, nah sorry, we don't want them. So you keep them. Really and then, Paul, you don't understand. That. He's not very good. That's why. No, you know, this is exactly my point. I don't understand why. Roma would think, oh yeah, he'll he'll do a job. Get in oh, there. I think he's a vice Jekyll, really. That, 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 that's why he's terrible. there. Yeah, well, I'm sure that like I think you could probably chuck him on against Sam Dore and he might score a couple of goals. <laughs> well, I think he could, he, he could manage that uh, mm. at the moment. But <laughs> see, big um, Kuma Babaka has gone to Lecce. He'd be a better player than Kalinic. Mm. Possibly. Mm. Maybe, but yeah, just with Roma, I think the midfield, the midfield additions have been decent or reasonably good, but uh, the defense is a banter defense, and uh, Callan needs to be a vice Jacko. Well, Patrick Schick has gone to RB Leipzig, so they needed someone to fill in. But yeah, Callan should just be warming the bench and no more than that, because if he's got to replace Jacko, God help Roma. Yeah, well, he's not going to replace him. He's going to be when Jekyll needs if a wee Jekyll, rest. Or if he gets injured or suspended. Or if he gets injured, yeah, yeah. yeah. if he gets injured, well, big problems. Big <laughs> if problems. we can come here for a minute to, to to me and my city that I'm living in, I think Parma have yes. done all right. Because the boy, uh, Hernani, looked quite good against Juventus. Kulusevski is a very good player. Who else did they get? Darmian coming in is good. They got Carlos yeah, like Bonelius. Yeah. I think they've done okay, you know. But they're not gonna be pulling up any trees or anything. But 
they really needed to sign someone to accompany Bruno Alves at the back because Bastoni's gone back to Inter and Simone Iacopone is not that guy. So that could be problematic for them. But everywhere else, I think they've done quite well this summer, you know. Oh, and they also still have Luigi Giuseppe, which is problematic. <laughs> Did you see him today? He was at it I didn't. I didn't see him today. No, I've been busy. Or yesterday. Well, he made a save, but instead of palming oh. it away from goal, he decided to go, ah, there you go, have another shot. And it didn't end well. But oh, there you go. This is Luigi. We're finished. Have you got anything else to say? Um... Um, no, I'm good. I think. Vito, have you anything else to say? No, that's about it. <laughs> I'll yeah, see you yeah. when I'm over there. Yeah, well, we won't be here next week because it's the international break. Yay! I've but got international stuff to do, so. Meh. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll be working, but I won't be doing the podcast. So you can still read us, but you can't listen to us, probably for the best. Oh. Anyway, go enjoy your international break, whatever country you're living in, unless it's any of the teams that Ireland are playing. Um, but, yeah, that's it. Speak to you in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye. Say goodbye, Dov. Bye, Dov. <laughs> you're a special, a special tiger. <laughs> charisma, mate. That's charisma. <laughs>